Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Is it on? Thank you. Well, first let me say <clears throat> I'm always honored and humbled to be able to speak, but um, this is the third time I've been to Baton Rouge in the last year, and I feel like I'm coming back to a home. So, Dr. Chastain, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I, I'm honored to be here with you and what you're trying to accomplish today. As you know, on January 15th, 2009, Another tragedy could have happened up in New York City. Instead, a miracle occurred. There were 155 people on U.S. Airways Flight 1549, and I was just one of those that day that were blessed. But the next 30 minutes, I'm going to share with you that experience. Some of the things I was thinking, and five things that I think really contributed to the outcome that day, whether it was about teamwork or leadership, resourcefulness, how you managed your mind or state, or the power of faith. The one thing I'd like for you to think about as I speak, the time that plane took off from LaGuardia, the time it crashed into the Hudson River, the time I got to the hospital was only about 30 minutes. And I wasn't supposed to be on this flight. I was scheduled to be on the 5 o'clock flight that night. But I was working in a distribution center that day in Brooklyn, New York, and what my job is as a sales manager. Not only here has ever been or worked in a warehouse or a distribution center, but they normally open up quite early in the morning. This one opened up at 2 o'clock in the morning. So we started our day at 5 o'clock, and we got done about 10 o'clock that morning. Now, I travel over 100,000 miles in what I do in my job as a sales manager. So any chance I get to get home to my wife and my four kids a little early, I usually try to take advantage of that. So about 10 o'clock that morning, I called our travel agent up and worked with her, and she put me on flight 1549. So I truly believe I was supposed to be on that plane for a reason. And there wasn't anything extraordinary about the day. Yes, it was 11 degrees and snowing in New York. And I know that's pretty unusual for here, but that's pretty normal in New York for the middle of winter. And I was one of the first set of passengers to board the plane that day because of my status with US Airways. I'm a chairman, I fly so much. So I boarded the plane and went back to my seat. I went to seat 15A. That's four rows behind that left wing. And I did exactly what I did every single time when I got on a plane. I bet some of you guys do when you go on a plane. I went back to my seat, I put my briefcase down, I put my wallet in the briefcase and pulled the magazine out and I started reading. I did not listen to the flight crew. I did not know where those exits were. And then I read that little brochure they always tell you to read. But I guarantee you every single time I get on a plane now I do. I know how important it is to be aware when you get on a plane. It was about 60 seconds after we took off is when I heard the explosion. And it was a loud explosion. I never heard anything on a plane like that before, so it got my attention. So I looked up, I looked out the window, and I saw fire coming out from underneath the left wing. So I knew something had happened, but I fly so often, I also know that planes lose engines at times. So at that point, nothing really startled me that much. See, that's where I think God's grace entered for the first moment. Because no one knew at that moment in time what happened on the left side of the plane also happened on the right side of the plane. I truly believe anybody were to cross-reference, checked in, what'd you see, what'd you hear, there could have been a lot of panic. People panic, people lose their heads. When people lose their heads, they start making irrational decisions. But to this day, the one thing that still sticks with me three years later about that day is no one said a word on this plane the entire time. It was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. But the guy next to me elbowed me and said, hey, what's going on? I said, I think he's going back to LaGuardia, back to the airport. I felt him banking. I just thought he was going back. But how fortunate we have a captain who not only has over 40 years of experience, over 20,000 hours of flight time, and was a fighter pilot in Vietnam, and a first officer also had over 20,000 hours of flight, flight time, and a captain who is a certified glider expert. I've had the honor to be with Captain Sullenberger three times in public. The last time is when he made his first flight back from New York to La, LaGuardia back to Charlotte. It was a big deal in Charlotte, a huge deal. And I was in a business meeting in Charlotte that day, just happened to be in Charlotte. And I got a phone call from what I call the lady behind the green curtain. At U.S. Airways. She can make all things happen. She's a very important person to know at U.S. Airways. A very good person to know. 
And she called me and said, do you want to do a press conference with Captain Sullenberger? Now, not only was it a perfect excuse to get out of a business meeting, right? But I was quite honored to be thought that way, to do a press conference with Captain Sullenberger. So I told the person I was working with, he knew who I was, so what, he said, I'll handle it, no big deal, go. So I went out to the airport, and I met the plane as it landed back from LaGuardia back to Charlotte. Now, I don't know if here has ever done any media or been in the media, but usually when they have these things, they have a little, like a green room in the back here where they hold you, right, until they bring you out to do your thing. So I'm back in this little green room with a couple other passengers who were also invited, Captain Skiles and Captain Sullenberger. And there was something I was dying to ask Captain Sullenberger, but, you know, I never had the right forum. I was always in public. I never had that chance to really ask him a question, but here's my shot. I'm going to ask Captain Sullenberger the question I was dying to ask him. And the question was, and now he also said this on his biography, so I feel at liberty to share it, was what was the moment of this whole thing? He told me, he said, most people think the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, was that crash landing. He said, that wasn't the moment. He said that his moment was getting that plane over the George Washington Bridge. See, he, he was heading straight for the George Washington Bridge. The bridge was about 600 feet up, and he cleared it about 900 feet. And he told me, he said, if I don't clear the bridge, not only do I take out a plane, but I take out a bridge. Now, several months ago, I had the opportunity to speak at Stephen F. Austin University over in Nacogdoches, Texas. And when I got done speaking, a guy came running up to me to talk to me, and he said, while you were speaking, I was Googling, trying to find out how many people are average on that bridge at any moment in time. He said, there's an average of 800 people on the bridge at any moment in time. So how fortunate we have a captain who is a certified glider expert who had to employ that skill at that moment in time, not only to save me and 154 other people, but to save a bridge in New York City. And as soon as he crossed over the bridge, he said the only three words he said the entire time, he said, brace for impact. Now, like I told you, I didn't pay attention to instruction. I didn't read the brochure. I did not know what that meant. But now I know it's serious. I never heard this one now. Never heard brace for impact on a plane before. So immediately I did two things. First thing I did is I prayed. I prayed whoever that captain was, just to get me down in one piece, man, one piece. Second thing I prayed for is the last person I talked to, who had to be my client up in Brooklyn, to call my wife and tell her I love her. The third thing I did is I prayed to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to forgive my sins. I didn't want anything between me and him at that point. We're going down. I wanted to go up. And it ain't looking good right now, right? We are not trending well right now, right? And the second thing I did is I reached down in my briefcase and got my wallet out. And I shoved it down into my pants because in case something happened, which looked like it was probably going to happen, at least they could claim my body. Who was I? And I put my head down. It was about 60 seconds after he cleared the bridge is when he crashed into the river. And it was a hard hit. He estimates he hit between 120 and 150 miles an hour. So when he hit, I went all the way back in my seat and all the way up in my seat just like that. It was a hard hit. When I came back up, I opened my eyes up, I looked out the window, and I saw a light. So I knew I had a shot, but I wasn't out yet. As you saw, the plane landed. It took the entire bottom of the plane off when it landed, and water started coming in immediately. So depending where you were on the plane, I was towards the back of the plane. Water was anywhere from ankle to knee deep, just like that. And then somebody actually did listen to the flight crew, and went to that closest exit, which may be behind you, and tried to open up that door. And if you go back and read the NTSB report, which I and all the rest of us were a part of, when they testified in front of Congress, they said the one thing that could have changed that entire day was that moment. Because if that door would have gotten wide open, water would have come in much faster than it did, and what, that plane already went to the bottom of the river in 24 minutes. It would just be partially open. Now, the biggest question I get as I travel is, how do these people get on these wings so quickly? I'm going to tell you how that happened. Like I mentioned, when we hit, when I went back in my seat, the seats broke. And when the seats broke, they lay down flat, and people got very resourceful at that moment in time. Started getting on top of the seats, started walking down the seats to get out the doors. 
Now, a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to speak to a group of bishops and priests in Providence, Rhode Island. A very unique audience. A very unique audience. And when I got done speaking, one of the bishops came, came up to me and said, Son, I think those seats broke because of divine grace. I said, Sir, I have no clue. I don't, I have no, I don't know. A few months later, I had the opportunity to speak to a group of engineers who make nuclear subs in Groton, Connecticut. A very, another very unique group. And one of the engineers, I don't know if he's ever been an engineer, but they're very unique. They think analytical. They think differently. And one of the guys came up to me and said, Dave, I think those seats broke because they were designed to break that way. I have no clue. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do when you don't have the answer, right? You call the lady up behind the green curtain, right? They have all the answers, right? The wizard has all the answers. So I called her up and said, listen, I'm getting this question all over the country. How did these seats break? She goes, we don't have a clue. <laughs> they just broke. But that's how most people got out. But I didn't do that. See, when I got up, my natural inclination was to go to the aisle. So when I got to the aisle, something happened to me. My mom got into my head, kicked into my head. See, my mom passed away in 1997. But there was something she would tell me when I was a kid that just all of a sudden popped into my head at that moment in time. And it was, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And to me, the right thing was, is you make sure everybody else was out first. So I just waited. And it wasn't like a minute, it wasn't like 30 seconds. You've got to remember now, man, things are happening fast. Things are rolling. The word I've used is controlled chaos. I mean, things are happening. It's not out of control, but, man, things are rolling now. So I just waited to make sure we got everybody else out. And then I got out, and I started making my way up the aisle. Now, you've got to remember, not only did the seats break, but also the bins broke. So now you've got luggage that have been flying out all over the place. So every time you took a step, you were hitting something. You've got to remember, now you're anywhere from ankle to knee to waist deep in the water. We're, we're a few minutes into this thing. So every time you took a step, you hit something. So you didn't know you were hitting in luggage, you hitting body. You didn't know what you were hitting. But all the further I could get up, let's make sure this works, was 10F. And the first picture that this happened to be released from the, inside the plane was me trying to get out of the plane. Uh, as soon as I got up, I tried to get out, but I couldn't get out of the plane. The wing was already filled up. The boat was already filled up. There was no room on the wing for me. There was no room on the boat for me. That's why I was waist deep in the 36 degree water on this plane for about seven minutes. But it was an amazing sight. There were already people being rescued a couple minutes into this thing. There were a lot of heroes that day. But the first of the first responders was the New York waterways, the ferryways. They were there in less than two minutes after this plane crashed. I've heard Captain Sullenberger speak, and I've heard him say this every single time I've heard him. He's exactly right. He says he and Skiles got everybody down that day, and the crew and passengers got everybody out that day. But the real heroes that day were the first responders. The World of Waterways was the first of the first responders. And you notice I'm holding on to this little lifeboat right here, and the reason was is I don't know if anybody here knows anything about the Hudson River. It's got a very fast current. This plane actually floated down the river about a half a mile in 24 minutes. That's how fast that current is. So this little lifeboat kept going in and out from the, from the plane, and no one knew at that point in time it was actually tethered to the plane, but no one knew that. So they were screaming, hold on, hold on. That's why I was holding on to the little lifeboat about six or seven minutes, trying to keep as close to the plane as I could. But then I looked up, and I looked out the wing, and something caught my eye. And what caught my eye was, there's this lady, she had a baby. In fact, I found out later she actually had two kids on this plane. She had a three-year-old who was already on this lifeboat, and a three-month-old she was holding on to in the middle of this wing. And she wasn't moving. She was stifled. And two things, man, all of a sudden went through my mind real quick. First was, man, if she tries to get on this lifeboat with this kid, now you've got to remember, not only is it 36-degree water, but you got jet fuel all over the place now. Nobody here's ever stepped or walked on jet fuel, but it's pretty slick. And there's people sliding all over the place. And my thought was, man, if she tries to get on this boat, she slips and gets in this river with this kid. But then sort of my logical business side sort of kicked in. And it's like, man, if she doesn't move, how am I going to get out of here? Because then she's standing in the middle of the swing and she ain't moving. So I just did what came naturally. You got to remember, you got adrenaline going now, right? And you're almost out, but you're not out yet. 
And one thing I just did is it just came naturally. I said, throw the baby, throw the baby. And logically, I knew she wasn't going to throw her baby. Logically, I knew that wasn't going to happen. But what happened was I got her attention. And she looked at me and she's like, what? But it's amazing where people are in situations like this. She just laid his head turned to the right and blonde hair. She just happened to be a mother of three from Knoxville, Tennessee. And she heard me scream this at this lady, and she looks up at this lady and says, give me the baby. And she gives her the baby, gets on this lifeboat, and all of a sudden people are walking down a wing. All of a sudden things are happening on the right side of the plane. Two years ago, I got this package. She's pretty beat up. I've carried it with me, this package from that lady. And it had two things in this package. First thing was, was a note that said, thank you for helping and saving our family. The second thing was a picture of the captain with the baby that was saved that day. The family, I don't think I did anything that significant. I don't think the lady from Knoxville did anything that significant. What I believe is this. The lady who gave up her baby did, pretty, did something pretty significant. Because this thing, how much faith it had to take to give your baby up, some guy who's screaming at you, and some lady you don't even know, and you give your baby up, I mean, that takes a lot of faith. But I'm not out yet. I'm still on the plane. And things are happening. And one thing about people from New York and New Jersey, I don't know anybody here from New York and New Jersey, but they get a bad rap. Because people from New York and New Jersey, the one thing they know how to do is respond. Because, unfortunately, they've had to respond to situations before in New York. So when they hear the all call, they don't wait around and say, you know, all right, we're going to wait, and we're all going to go. They just go, and then they figure it out. And one of those guys happened to be a tugboat captain. He was at a station, and he heard all this stuff going on on the radios, and he brought his tugboat out. And I got a chance to talk to him a couple years ago and hear his story. And he told me this. He goes, I, brought, I heard this all call go out. I came out, and I saw this little lifeboat, and my goal was to get this little lifeboat out of the way. So he got, came right in to see where the boats were coming in, more from the New York side. And he came in, he, he threw this rope, and he's trying to pull this little lifeboat out, though, which was a good plan. But what he wasn't planning on was people standing on a wing. So there's no way he could pull the lifeboat out of the way. He was blocked. So he's getting beeped out, right? I mean, as things are happening, you're beeped out, you've got to go, next boat's coming in. So he got beeped out, so he dropped the rope, and he starts backing his boat out, out for the next boat to come in. And when he started boat backing out, he hit the front of the plane. Now, Canley, that's not that big a deal. Unless you're on the plane. And I was on the plane. And what happened was, when he hit the plane, all it did is just shake the plane. But you got to remember, we're six, seven minutes into this thing now, and there's, I'm waist deep in the water. When he hit the plane, it sort of sloshed around, and I took water right up my backside. And as soon as I felt that, man, the first thing I thought about was that movie Titanic. I remember that movie, but that boat tipped up, it sucked everything down with it in a vacuum. That's exactly what I said. I don't want to be sucked down in a plane. I've got this far. Do not be sucked down in a plane. So I always stop when I talk at this point. I always thank my mom and my dad. Because you know what? If they hadn't had enough forethought when I was a kid to give me swimming lessons, I'd never been able to get off this plane. I have the honor now to speak to a lot of youth groups, colleges and universities around the country. And this is a point I get to speak to them about. You know, I don't know if you ever have kids. I'm sure you got, some of you guys got kids. But some of my, my, my kids say, why do I have to learn this? Why do I have to do this? You know, I'm never going to use it. And I give them this circuit. I say, listen, just think of this day. If Captain Sullenberger, when he goes to the Air Force Academy, doesn't take gliding as a class and learn how to glide, I'm not here today. 154 of the people are not here today. 800 people on a bridge are not here today because he took a class. He learned how to glide. If my mom and dad didn't make me learn how to swim, I'm not here today. You never know when you learn something 30, 40 years ago that you may have to employ at that moment to save yourself or save somebody else. And what I had to do was swim. So I jumped in the water and I swam to the closest boat that I could find and just happened to be the end of this wing. Yeah, remember, I've been in the water seven minutes. The EMTs to this day will tell you, they do not know how physically I got there except for adrenaline. When I got there, you notice the light, I know you've been on the ferries, but they used to have those metal ladders like that. Well, they have little orange plastic ladders they roll down. 
they don't have little elevators to take people in and out of the water. They don't get paid to rescue people, right? They get paid to take people back and forth from Jersey to New York. Mine had an orange plastic ladder. So when I got there, I got my backside in. And now they're yelling, you got to climb, you got to climb. And I yelled up, I can't, I can't. And then my mom kicked into my head again. Because the word my mom hated most in life was the word can't. See, when I was a kid, if you said, I can't, my mom said, if you can't, you must. She made you do it. Here I said, can't. So I got one arm up to this day. I do not know who these two, two guys are, these two gentlemen are. They're angels. They reached down and grabbed my arms and pulled me onto one of these ferries. And you can see these decks are six, eight feet up. They pulled me up and threw me on one of the ferries. Now I'm sliding on the ice on a ferry. I don't know where I'm at. Now they're yelling, you got to get up, move, move, move. And I got up to the side, and that's when the adrenaline drops. I don't know if there's an e any EMTs in here or anybody like that that will tell you. You can go all day on adrenaline, right? You see women picking up cars, right? But when the adrenaline's gone, I couldn't feel anything. I was so cold, I couldn't even think. I didn't know why I was in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. I didn't know where I was at. But it's amazing where God puts people. But there was a guy on this ferry. He had a gray suit on. He had a laptop on his back, and most importantly, he was dry. But he had an iPhone. He came walking up to me and said, call your wife and put it right in my face. Now, I couldn't dial the phone, so I got the, got the number out. He dialed the phone and put it back in front of my face, and the only thing that I could get out was, I've been in a plane crash. Now, my wife's not at home waiting for me to tell her what I'm doing. She's got a life of her own. But my daughter, who was home from high school, heard the voice message, turned on CNN, Saw all this stuff breaking loose, and that's how my family found out that I was in a plane crash, but didn't know where I was at. Now, I don't know if anybody here has ever been in New York or New Jersey, but this picture sort of tells you exactly where this thing happened. You can see the Empire State Building right in the back. To the left of that, or the right of that, and the left in the picture is Manhattan, those big buildings. To the right is actually Hoboken, New Jersey. In New Orleans, back in January, I had the opportunity to speak with the guy who wrote the plan, the rescue plan. And he was telling, going through this with a group of people, and I got to hear it. And part of the plan was pretty simple. Whatever side you're facing towards, closest point to the shore is where you're going to go. And I was pointing towards New Jersey. I went out to the right, so I'm heading to New, Jer New Jersey, a place called Weehawken, Bergen County, that area. And they radioed ahead because I knew I'd been in the water, so, and I wasn't probably responding, but they radioed ahead. So when we hit the shore, there were three people waiting for me. And there were two EMTs. The guy from the American Red Cross. And that's why I speak now nationally for the American Red Cross. And that's what brought me to Baton Rouge last year was the Red Cross. Because I have all these groups, this is a little known fact, I have all these groups that touched a lot of us that day. There were only two groups that touched everyone. New York Waterways and the American Red Cross on both the Jer New Jersey side and the New York side. And those three people picked me up took me to a little room, they call it a triage room. It's just a room like this, actually, just with no chairs, just like this. And they put me down on the floor, and they stripped my clothes down to my skivvies, and Heather, my EMT, says, I'll be right back. So now I'm on the floor, naked, and I don't know what's going on, right? I look over here, there's a guy sort of the same situation I am. I look over here, there's a girl, she didn't even have any clothes on. And we're all looking at each other, we're all naked, but then no one's talking now, right? No one's saying a word, you know? But all of a sudden, this guy comes walking up to me. He had a card in his hand. He said, sir, I need your name and I need your date of birth. So he writes it down on this card and he takes my foot and he walks away. Yeah, I grew up in the 70s, that TV show MASH, right? Remember that? When they take your foot, man, they're carding you out, right? Game over, done. It is overtime, right? And all of a sudden, here I am, I'm sitting on the ground, I'm, I'm naked, I'm cold, I can't talk and I got a tag on my foot, right? I'm thinking I'm dead. It's like, I said, it's like that movie Ghost. It's true. You watch yourself die, right? You can't touch it, but you're watching yourself die. And all of a sudden, Heather, my EMT, comes walking back up and says, I've got to take your blood pressure. I said, good, i got a blood pressure, right? That's good. But it wasn't, because I had a 190 over 120. She told me, we've got to go stat right now. You could have a heart attack or a stroke. We've got to go right now. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking... I survived a plane crash. I survived a water landing. And I'm going to die of a heart attack or a stroke. Someone's throwing fastballs. It was a wake-up call. 
Those, those, those three people picked me up, put me on a gurney, and wheeled me out. And as soon as we hit the doors, when the media hit. Now, I'd never been around media before, right? And all of a sudden, this guy from NBC had his story. Last passenger off. And he was following me. And all of a sudden, they're putting me in this ambulance, right? He's trying to get in the ambulance with us. This guy slams the door on him. Now, I don't know where I'm at now. Right? I don't know where I'm going. They haven't told me anything. All I know is I'm not doing pretty, very well right now. So they take me to a place. It's a place called um, Palisades Medical Center. And once again, people in New Jersey get a bad rap. Because when I got there, they opened the doors, and there were like 30 or 40 people just waiting for me. They know how to respond. And these 10 women, guys, listen to this, 10 women with blankets picked me up. And I'm not a small guy. Picked me up. Put me on this bed right here. There was a doctor there. Now it is go time. The doctor's now going out. The ladies are hitting on my legs, trying to get circulation going. I don't know what's going on. The doctor's now yelling out orders. He goes, blood pressure, 190 over 120. I knew that wasn't good because Heather, my EMT, said I could die of a heart attack or a stroke. I knew that one wasn't good. He said oxygen, 75. And I didn't know what that meant. Found out later, that's not very good. And he said, take his temperature. Temperature orally was 96. And he yells out, take it anally, and all of a sudden I woke up. I got that one, right? <laughs> Man, I knew what's coming now, right? And all of a sudden, Nurse Bautista, who's on my right arm, who stayed with me the entire time, who's my angel, is screaming at this doctor, I can't get him off. I can't get him off. What happened was, she was trying to get my underwear off. And my body was so cold and so wet, they had basically frozen to my hips. So she was pulling and pulling. She couldn't get these things off. And I still have scars on my hips to this day. But all of a sudden, there's always a nurse in the room, always, when I speak. And I'll tell you, what does a nurse always have? Scissors like this long, right? Clip, rip. I am down to my watch. That's all I got left with my watch, right? Because my temperature was 94. That's why they diagnosed me with hypothermia. It took them about five hours, basically, to get my body temperature back up. Five hours. That's how cold my body was, guys. But that was an amazing five hours. Because not only did I get to meet the former governor of New Jersey, the head of Port Authority in New York, New York State Police, New Jersey State Police, Homeland Security, FBI. They all wanted to talk to me and another passenger who was on my left who broke his sternum because he was the first guy out. He jumped in the water and he hit flat and he broke his sternum. So here's a little known fact about that day that's never been talked about in the press. There were eight people that day, passengers, not counting crew, passengers. Eight went to the hospital. Five went to Columbia, which is over in New York City. Three went to Palisades, which is over in Jersey. Out of those eight people, two people stayed the night, Barry and I. 148 passengers walked home after a plane crash in ice cold water a couple hours after it happened. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. But they knew, so they knew where to find us. They had questions. And one of the questions they asked me was, do you think this was a terrorist attack? Because if you have a plane going towards a bridge in New York, you're probably going to ask questions. And I said no, and I think Barry said the same thing. But these are the kind of questions we were getting all night. But all night long, I kept going to the doctor. I said, doctor, I have no clothes. I have no clothes. The doctor kept saying, why do you need clothes? You're in, a you're in a hospital. You don't need clothes. What he didn't know was this. Well, not only did all the security people know where we were, but also the ABC, CBS, Fox. They found us, right? And they, we agreed to do Good Morning America, the early show, and all these shows, and I had no clothes to wear. So somebody in the middle of the night from the northern New Jersey chapter of the Red Cross went out and got me some really ugly sweats to wear that next morning. So if you go Google that next morning, January 16th, on the early show of Good Morning America, you'll see it. Boy, that taught me something else. If somebody had enough forethought to think of me in the middle of the night to give me something to wear. That's why I speak so passionately for the Red Cross. So when something like this happens, U.S. Airways actually gives you like a liaison, a person who basically, you know, is there for you. And basically she had one job. Mine was Doreen from Pittsburgh. And her job, it was whatever I wanted, man. So while I was doing these shows, she was trying to get me home, make arrangements, give me some shoes, get me home, the whole thing, right? So they wheel me back down. They wouldn't let me walk back from this little interview thing. They wheel me back to the room, and now I'm ready to go home, right? And she's like, listen, I don't want any more stress on you. 
I'm going to put you on the 12 o'clock flight back. She had me on the 10 10 flight. I said, No, I want to go back now. See, I talked to my wife that night. She could pull the kids out of school, right? They're going to meet me at the airport, the whole thing, right? She goes, No, listen, I can't, I can't get you there. I'm going to put you on the 12. I said, No, I want to go home now. My kids are going to freak. I got to go home now. She goes, No, listen, you're not understanding me. I physically can't get you there. See, you're in New Jersey. You're going out of LaGuardia. I physically can't get you there in time with this flight. It's like I told you the night before, everybody wanted to talk to me, right? Everybody wanted to be my friend. And one of those was a head of Port Authority. And that's the moment I realized how important that position is in New York City. Because he left his car and said, call me if you need anything. And I'm cashing in, guys. I am cashing it in right now. <laughs> so I told Doreen, I said, call this guy. And she's like, looks at this, you know, director of Port Authority. She's like, what? I said, call the guy. He said, he'd help me if I needed help, call him. So she called the guy, and three or four minutes later, I have a police escort from Weehawken, New Jersey, to LaGuardia, in a pimped-out Escalade, me and my hoodie, right? <laughs> 16 minutes later, I'm in LaGuardia, right? U.S. Air would say, that's a miracle, right? Who gets a police escort through Manhattan, right? But I got there, right? I pull up. There's media there. You're in New York City, right? There's media. I got through that. I go in. I had nothing to check. Right? I had nothing, right? But the one thing no one thought about was, I didn't have an ID. How am I going to get through New York security without an ID, right? I told you the night before I got to meet Homeland Security, cashed the card in, right? <laughs> I mean, it was like checking the box. So I got through right, went down to the plane. They already radioed ahead to the captain, told him, you have somebody from the plane crash on your plane. So the captain, what he did was, he never talked to anybody who survived a plane crash. So he pulls everybody off the plane, puts me on and sits down with the crew and wants to have a little talk with me, right? Telling them what happened. But what he wasn't planning on is I had questions for him too. Are you going to get me over this bridge, right? Are you going to get me home, right? Now I'm firing questions at a captain, and the captains are not usually, used to having people ask him questions, right? They're the ones giving orders. And he says, sir, I don't have gliding experience. I will get you over the bridge, and I will get you home safe, and I'll do something for us. When, when we hit 3,300 feet, See, that's all the higher the plane ever got was 3,300 feet. I'll ring the bell. So you and I also know where this happened yesterday. So they put me back in coach, right? I put my hood up like the Unabomber sitting there like this, man. You know, I'm not talking to anybody, right? You know, they give me free potato chips, free Cokes, wherever I wanted, right? It was free, 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 free. And all of a sudden, I hear ding, ding, ding. I look out the window. I'm like, man, 3,300 feet's not that high up. And all of a sudden, I started putting this thing together in my head. was, man, not only did Captain Sullenberger as a hero and what he did, but Captain Skyle as a first officer. Because I don't know anybody here has ever talked to a first officer, but they have this book up there. It's how you get down from 30,000-foot book. And he did it from 3,000 feet. He's as much a hero as Captain Sullenberger. But you never hear about this guy because he's humble. Now, you know, we made the final descent down right. About Greensboro, North Carolina, has been made a final descent call. And all of a sudden, the guy two seats over opens up page four of Newsday. And what's on page four of Newsday? That picture right there. Some of the Associated Press snuck in the hospital, took this picture and between the curtains as they were going after me. Security needed to be tightened up a little bit. So all of a sudden, he's looking at me. It's like, you're that guy on that plane, right? I'm like, man, my picture's in the paper. He said, you were on that plane. He said it loud enough so everybody hears it. And all of a sudden, all of you look at the freak show with the hoodie on, right? And all of a sudden, the crew's like, get down, because we we're on final descent. And all of a sudden, I, she goes, are you okay? And I'm like, let's take me off this plane last. I don't want to talk to anybody, man, please. So she says, no problem. So she runs up when we land, stands right there next to me. She's a hero to me, basically protects me from anybody. So they take me off the plane. And yes, my family was there, and U.S. Airways was there, but... The CEO of the American Red Cross was also there, which I realized at that moment, the most important part of this whole thing was she taking care of my family. Because I was being taken care of, right? I was getting more attention than I probably deserved, but no one takes care of the family, and she was. That's why I speak so passionately for the Red Cross. But that's where my miracle now turns into a mission, and I want to share with you how that happens and end up that way. The Sunday after the plane crash, I went to my church. Now, I'm a Methodist. I went to my church. No, but here's a Methodist. But the Methodist church, they have this thing called men's breakfast. Right? So the guy, 
comes to me. I'm on the church. I'm shaking hands, right, and meeting with people. God comes up and says, Dave, will you speak at our men's breakfast next Sunday? I said, no problem. 50 old guys eating pancakes, man. I got it, right? No big deal. I know they advertise all over Charlotte. They have five, 600 people show up this thing now. I don't know what I'm going to say, right? So I go behind here and I say, man, give me a message. Give me something to say, which part of what I came up with today and share with you today, out of that one little prayer, give me, give me something to say, man. I said it. Whatever I got out that day, I got it out. But I'm standing here in the middle of the room just like this, sort of this, this big a room, talking to a couple guys right here like this. And all of a sudden, I look up. I see this lady standing right in the middle, in the back. She's probably 80 or 85 years old. And staring at me, man, right in the eyes, locking and locking and loading with me. And all of a sudden, she starts making her way up this aisle, just like this. And these guys part like the Red Sea. It's like she has an aisle, right? She had a lot of power. And she walks up to this, and she interrupts this conversation. And she grabs my arm really tight. One thing that I found out that I did not know until that point was, when you have hypothermia, right, your body's so cold, I was beat up on the plane. So about two, two or three days later, I got bruises, man, popping up all over the place. I don't know where these bruises came from, so I'm covered with bruises. She grabs my arm, so I like jump, like I don't know what's going on, right? But she looked me in the eye and told me something that changed the entire direction of my life. She said, I was questioning if there was a God. I don't believe in miracles, but you are physical evidence that there is a God. And he performs miracles. Thank you. Thank you. And she let my arm go, turns around, walks away, never to be seen in our church again. And all of a sudden, I look at these guys, and these guys are starting to cry. I look over, and I was like, all of a sudden, it came to me. What happened to me that day had now impacted somebody who now believes there's a greater being who does miracles because I'm physical evidence. And that is the reason I am with you this morning in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that moment. Because I do not know across this whole world who I'm going to impact. That's why I'm here. You know, the question I get all the time is, did you get your luggage back, right? <laughs> the answer to that question is, I got some of it back, but you got to remember, it's in the river. It smelled, right? And they did as good a job as they could to try to clean it, but it smelled. You know, but I had something on the plane that had a high value, personal value to me. It wasn't business stuff, it was personal. And someone gave me this Mont Blanc pen. I don't know if you heard of Mont Blanc, but they're very expensive pens. And I lost it, but the U.S. Airways was taking great care of me. I've, said, I've spoken nothing but great things about them, and they've spoken but nothing but great things about me. So I knew they were going to take care of it. But August came. I got this package in the mail. And somebody, when they dredged the bottom of the river, had found this pen, my Mont Blanc pen. They had it in a warehouse in New Jersey. Somebody finally got it to me. So I get this back, and I'm excited, right? I got my Mont Blanc pin back, right? So I go down to the Mont Blanc store in Charlotte. I said, go up to the, the manager. and I said, hey, can you fix my pin? She's like, fix your pin? They're like looking at me like, fix your pin? So she opens it up. It's like silt and crap's coming out of it, right? She's like, what happened to your pin? I said, well, they found it at the bottom of the Hudson River. She goes, Hudson River? Were you a part of that plane? I said, I was, I was on the plane crash. She goes, listen. I'll fix it for free, no problem. I said, no, I'll pay for it, no big deal. She said, no, we'd be honored to do that. But will you do something for us? And I was like, yeah, you're going to fix my pen, right? Sure, I'll do anything for you. She goes, we'd like to use your story. You know, Mont Blanc survives plane crash, you know? <laughs> you know, listen, hey, listen, you know, if you're going to fix my pen, use the story. So this, they send this to Hamburg, Germany. This thing's out. This pen is now all over the world, this picture of this pen, right? But that's not where the story ends. Several months later, I was a contributing author of a book called Brace for Impact. And I was doing book signings all over the country. And the lady called me up and said, listen, we'd like to do something for you. We'd like to do a book signing at our store, and we'll donate 100% of the money to the Red Cross. So I did this book signing with Barry. We raised over $800 that, that afternoon for the Red Cross. And we did it again in New Jersey. I did it two months ago in Phoenix. I'm doing it in October up in Denver. And all of a sudden, from somebody doing something nice, we're raising money now for people who need money all over the country. That's the power of contribution. That's the power of doing something right. The last thing I'll share for this before I take some questions is, you know, there's a story that Captain Sullenberger told us, and it relates to what, sort of what you're doing here today. We were, uh, we were on one of these shows, and he was talking to us about 
personal responsibility. And what he was telling us about was, he's like, listen, if I could land this, land this plane, say in a lake around Orlando, it would be a totally different outcome. And we're like, why? You know, what's the difference? He goes, because people on this plane took personal responsibility. You got to remember, on this plane out of New York, the variables were basically, we had one family and one elderly lady. The rest of the people are taking their own personal responsibility. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to think about personal responsibility. So when I get back to Charlotte, I did a talk at our church. And a lady who happened to be an internist heard me speak. And she came up to me and said, have you been checked out yet? See, part of the agreement for, for them to release me from the hospital Palisades was I was going to go home and get a physical because my blood pressure was sky high, right? So I agreed. I agreed to anything just to get the hell out of the hospital, right? I want to get out. So I agreed, but I didn't do it. So she heard me speak. She goes, listen, have you been checked out yet? I said, no, I haven't been checked out. She goes, listen, come in at 7 o'clock Monday morning. I'll come in early. I'll do free. I'll check you out. So I go to, the hospital, go to her office down in Charlotte. She checks me out. My blood pressure was still high. So she's not questioning. He's like, listen, it's been a, been a few months. Your blood pressure's still high. We've got to check your blood pressure. So now we're monitoring my blood pressure. She goes, have you had a colonoscopy yet? I said, no. You've got to get one. I said, no, no, I don't. No, I don't. You know, listen, I'm good, right? So no, you need to have one. You're, you're almost 50 now. Time to get one. So I do this colonoscopy, and they found four polyps, right? Precancerous, right? But if I didn't take that, if, I didn't, if someone didn't take enough interest after hearing this story, to let my blood pressure regulated, a colonoscopy, and she checked the prostate thing, she told me all about this prostate thing, it's, it's controversial, right? Did all this stuff, we checked it out, everything's cool. But somebody who just happened to hear me speak took some interest in me, and now at least I'm on the better pathway to health. Because candidly, I didn't ever get checked, guys. I'm a guy, right? I don't need to be checked. I hadn't been checked for 10 years. Only reason I went after this to even do anything because they told me I had to get a tetanus shot because I ingested all this water. And the Hudson River water is pretty nasty. So they told me I had to get a tetanus shot. That's what we result from a tetanus shot is all of a sudden now my blood pressure is being regulated. I found out I'm on this pathway to hopefully health. And that's why I think it's a great thing that Dr. Chastain and this group is doing. That's why I wanted to be here today. Because you never know when something's happening. You never, never know. Because it goes back to the story of this plane crash. It's a story of hope. Because if you think about what happened that day, there could have been a lot, of, a lot of people suffering that day. There's a passage in the Bible, guys. I don't know if you read it. It says, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. And that's, that's what happened. This outcome could have been totally different that day, guys. There could have been a lot of people suffering that day in a plane crash. But people endured. And all of a sudden, you have somebody with character like Captain Sullenberger who's out there, right? This guy's a leader. You ever have a chance to <coughs> excuse me, talk to him, you'll get it. This guy's focused, and he gets an outcome. And he could teach a lot of people a lot of things. You may have seen this picture. It's a picture of hope. You, know, you might think, maybe this did happen that day. Maybe everybody on that plane was there for a reason. And maybe there is a greater being saying, listen, if you believe and take care of yourself and take personal responsibility, contribute, you can impact somebody. And that is the reason I'm in Baton Rouge today. So Dr. Chastain, thank you once again. I'm honored to be here. May God bless you. May God bless your help. And most importantly right now, may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.